name is Sarah Mabasari. I'm a cardiologist here at Piedmont Heart Institute in Atlanta. And um, I work in our echo lab doing a lot of the imaging support for some of these transcatheter therapies that you've been hearing about, in particular uh, mitroclit. And um, I wanted to share a case with you and kind of go through um, our workflow of what we do when we uh, look at these patients, everything from the pre-candidacy to intraprocedural, and then when we see these patients in follow-up. And you can imagine these patients are surgical turndowns for mitral valve surgery. So when we see them in the office and they're complaining of shortness of breath, we want to make sure that their MR is not um, a variable, um, as most of them have other comorbidities, diastology, that would cause their shortness of breath. So um, this is really going to be more of a talk about how to assess um, residual MR during mitroclip. This is immediately during peri post procedure. Um, and as you can imagine, the mitro, um, quantification of mitral regurgitation in these patients with mitroclip can be challenging because you've significantly altered the geometry of the mitral valve using the clip. So, some of the parameters that we use for native valve mitral regurgitation. Um, are very difficult to apply for mitroclip. So yes, you can have some of the qualitative assessments when you're after clip is in place and telling us it's one plus or two plus. Um, I think we really want to gravitate more to um, semi-quantitative and quantitative. When we do our assessment pre and post clip, we do as much of this as we can in the lab. So um, vena contracta, very difficult. PISA, very difficult. We do try to do pulmonary vein flow. Um, look at reversal or blunting of uh, the flow. Um, I'd also add to the semi-quantitative uh, metrics that we use. We also use um, flow across the right side so we could do pulmonary valve or RVOT, VTI, and compare it to your LV, VTI, um, just as a parameter. But I think we really want to use regurgitant uh, volume and um, fraction, in particularly for secondary MR. And then, of course, ERO. So um, for purposes of this talk, we're going to be talking about immediate or peri-post procedure. Are we... Is there significant MR there? Are we going to be adding that second clip? This is all basically with TEE imaging um, and not like when we see them in the office and we have transthoracic. So um, we'll, typical patient, 85-year-old um, history of rheumatic heart disease, multiple comorbidities, um, not a patient for mitral valve surgery, so we took her to the lab, and I'm going to just kind of go through our workflow when we're in the lab. So um, LV function, mitral valve, very rheumatic appearing, anterior leaflet thickening, um, almost with high resolution you can see, uh, nobular thickening, some override with the posterior leaflet completely immobile and calcified. Somewhat of a problem for grasping because you have calcification in both the leaflets, so that might be problematic for the implanters. Um, so in our lab, we do this a very systematic approach when there were in the cath lab or um, um, outside of the cath lab. So we go through around the horn from um, zero to 30 to 60, so that with and without color, so that we can systematically um, review the pathology and the hemodynamics, and we don't miss anything. So we do this both pre and post. So um, this patient had a significant PISA and somewhat eccentric, so I imagine that a lot of this is underestimated. Um, and then we always do a valve gradient <clears throat> to, before we clip the patient. This patient had a valve gradient of about two, but the concerning thing is that the pulse rate was only about 40, which we didn't think was really physiologic for the patient when she started walking around. So we'll come back to that. Um, then we do a 3 3D volume acquisition of the LV, particularly looking at the inflow outflow. Um, and in this, what we want to do is have enough color flow here so you can see the LVOT outflow. And, and with this, we currently have offline a way to look at regurgitant inflow and LV outflow so we can calculate regurgitant volume. So uh, here, are, these are just disks in place to look at the mitral valve inflow, LVO outflow. Um, 
And that way we have you know, some numbers to look at. And it looks like we have a regurgitant volume of close to 55. And sometimes there's a question if the patient has aortic insufficiency, does that affect the uh, calculation? Mild, maybe even moderate, doesn't really affect it. But even if you had severe aortic insufficiency with this, you have to remember that we're looking at relative change in, in the same patient from baseline to uh, post-procedure, post-clip. So the degree of AI is not going to change. Again, it's all relative. So we can still use this in patients that have other valvular lesions. Um, so again, going through the workflow, we have our DART here with the Siemens platform where you can basically center your eye over the uh, coaptation line of the mitral valve. Um, you can see very restricted posterior leaflet, some anterior override. This is just artifact or dropout. I could easily change the gain on that. But more importantly, you see the color flow here. You have severe, um, uh, I guess, posterior medial uh, eccentric MR. On the LV side, you see the flow convergence um, telling you that you also have significant MR. So. Um, uh, with our anatomy in place, we went ahead and did some other measurements. I did transgastric views here. And again, as you've heard from some of the other speakers, you know, assessment of 2D with planimetry is probably underestimated only because you don't know where in that valve orifice you're truly getting the, um, annu uh, the valve orifice uh, measurement. Um, so with the Siemens platform, we have automation of the valves, and you've seen this before with some of the modeling that we've done, so that with the automation of the valve, you can actually get a true mitral valve orifice, and as you can see, the planimetered valve area was probably underestimated, and the 3D <clears throat> valve area was closer to 3.9. Again, these were some of the baseline measurements that we normally go through. We were a little concerned about her valve gradient, and we, what we wanted to do is give her some atropine, and we actually paced the patient so that we could get a heart rate up in the 60s. And you know, with pacing and atropine, the valve gradient was around four. So again, this is a rheumatic small annulus. Um, I think we just wanted to make sure that we wouldn't have mitral stenosis with this patient. Um, the rest of the procedure, um, you've heard from other speakers before, went pretty well. With the uh, mitral clip arms um, fully extended, you can see that you're um, perpendicular to the coaptation line, and you really are on top of the MR jet. We're probably a little too lateral here. And then with repositioning, it looks like we're right in the jet. Um, we go back and forth between 2D and 3D. Um, to find out exactly positioning, and when we feel like we're in the jet, both by 2D and 3D, we make our initial grasp. Um, however, this, the gradient that we got with this first grasp was about six and a half, and we were a little concerned about it. Again, the um, tissue in this valve was very thickened, redundant, calcified, so I think we were wanting to be very selective because we knew we were only going to have one shot with one clip. So um, the operators decided to reposition, and they wanted to go a little bit more medial. You can see that the clip is uh, more medial than when it was first placed. Um, and we have good um, you know, interruption of the flow. We're in the middle of the flow. So I think they were happy with this, and we went ahead and took this grasp. And this time, the gradient was 5, and the pulse rate was about 66. Very phys physiologic, and they were comfortable with that. So with that grasp, they went ahead and released um, the, uh, the, the guide cath. Um, so here we are with the question of how much MR do we have. You have multiple jets. This is a commissural view. You know, in the lab, when you're talking to one another, you try to have the same language between the implanters and uh, the imagers. And sometimes you don't always uh, you're not always on the same page. So we're, we're saying one plus, two plus. This is more of a qualitative assessment. It really doesn't look that bad, um, but we still want to look at some other um, measurements. Um, so looking at it by 2D and 3D, we, we know we have a dual orifice there. We went a little bit more medial. Um, and we do have um, looking at real-time color flow on top of the clip you can see that your mitral valve regurgitation here is significantly reduced. And on the LV side, you don't really have the flow convergence that you saw um, prior to clip. Sorry, this isn't playing. 
Um, Semi-quantitatively, we didn't, I didn't show you prior to the clip, but the patient did have flow reversal um, in systole, and now you can see that with the semi-quantitative metric, you have return of pulmonary vein flow, um, normal configuration of pulmonary vein flow, so another quantitative, semi-quantitative metric that helps us feel good about the MR in this patient. Um, again, gradient only about five. So, Again, we started off with um, a regurgitant volume of close to 55, cardiac output of two. Um, and now, post-clip, we can do the same uh, volume analysis. The only thing with MitraClip, though, is that you have um, inflow with two orifices. So when you are um, looking at your um, 3D volume acquisition with color flow. It's very important that you have, I think most times, sometimes we're very concerned about getting a high frame rate or a, ha a high volume per second rate, and we narrow our sectors, um, the azimuthal and the elevational sectors, so that we may constrict some of this volume. So it's important to liberalize that field of view so that you get all of the mitral inflow um, when you're doing it post-clip because you, you have multiple jets. Um, and with this, um, with this inflow analysis, our regurgitant volume went from um, 55 to 18. Um, again, this is different because our heart rate is uh, slightly changed in the cardiac output. More forward flow, your stroke volume has increased and your cardiac output has increased. Um, and then with the, two, uh, the valve automation, we can confirm that the valve orifice area is decreased to 1.2 from 3.8. Um, and in the lab, when we look at um, the final result, we have a one-clip patient that had mixed disease of mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, um, with a gradient of five. And the only thing we really have to corroborate with what we saw qualitatively, semi-quantitatively in the regurgitant volume was the LA pressure. So. Um, the implanter went ahead and did a transeptal and had a LA pressure originally of 27 with a reduction to 10 along with the V-wave. So these are just some other hemodynamics that corroborate what we found with um, some of the echo imaging pieces. So the only other thing in terms of validation of what we do, and the, the hope is that we will someday have this technology real time that when we're in the lab, we can say, hey, the regurgitant volume is reduced to, from this volume to this volume. Um, the only other way we have to corroborate this data is you've heard about is with cardiac MR. So when we see these patients in follow up, and this is really more with transthoracic, you can look, and this was a study that was done in 2013, looking at um, um, the PISA and the regurgitant volume through the entire cardiac cycle, because as you know, depending on where you are in the cardiac cycle, you may have more of a PISA or MR than other areas. So when you, when you go through the entire cardiac cycle and you look at the PISA and the regurgitant volume, there is good data to corroborate the regurgitant volume that you get with the 3D um, echo and regurgitant volume that corroborates with cardiac MR. So this was a paper that looked at end diastolic and end systolic, end systolic volumes with cardiac MR using regurgitant volume, um, both with um, MR and also um, volumes by aortic uh, stroke volume with phase, phase contrast imaging. And in this, there was good corroboration with the 3D um, reg regurgitant volume and cardiac MR. And I think that's all I have to say about uh, MR assessment in patients uh, in the lab. Thank you.